What I want to start with today in the Trump stuff, um, it, it, two things here that are equally important. And I, I, one of them that's important, potentially, the judge in the Michael Flynn case is named... Is the judge in the Ted Stevens case, the Ted Stevens trial, and in that trial, the prosecutors... The same group of people on Mueller's team, the prosecutors in that case, suborned perjury from the star witness against Ted Stevens, a contractor, a home repair guy. They got Ted Stevens kicked out of the Senate for supposedly accepting a kickback of 150 grand for a remodeling job in his house that he didn't pay for. That's what Ted Stevens was charged with that a contractor did a 150000 remodeling job and gave him the work in exchange for whatever Ted Stevens could do for the guy as a senator. That guy, that contractor, was, was asked to lie about Ted Stevens and what he asked for on the witness stand. And Judge Ed found out about this, and he raised holy hell with these prosecutors he overturned the conviction of Ted Stevens after Ted Stevens was was gone from the Senate. They succeeded in defeating him in his election. It was too late to get his Senate seat back, but they overturned the conviction, and the lawyers in this case were sanctioned mightily by Judge They're back, and they're on Mueller's team. Sidney Powell has written about all of these people, starting with Andrew Weissman, in her book that Amazon will not sell, called License to Lie. I have quoted from that book, I have cited that book, I have suggested that you try to find that book for almost nine months now. Wants to see He's ordered Mueller to turn over all of the interview documents with Michael Flynn after we learned that the FBI in the White House did not tell Flynn that he was actually being interviewed and told him he didn't need a lawyer. He was set up. Michael Flynn, a decorated military hero for 30 years, was set up by the FBI on the orders of James Comey. Judge has now discovered this, and he has demanded by tomorrow that all the documents relating to the Flynn case be turned over to him. Now, among those documents will be sworn statements by Andrew McCabe and, and a couple other FBI agents that they don't think Flynn lied. And McCabe was the one that did the interview. And they don't, it just, he walked into the White House one day and wants to, talk to, uh, wants to talk to Flynn. And Flynn doesn't know what's up. In its early days administration, they've just gone through the transition. So here's somebody from the friendly FBI. We're all in this together. Wants to talk to him. Flynn said, sure, what do you want to know? It was an interview. It was an entrapment interview. And they told him, no, 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 you don't need a lawyer for this. And Comey's out there bragging about how he pulled this off. And he's getting laughter from the audiences that he tells the story to. So, has been there and seen all of this. And to demand all of these documents by Friday, we can only hope. But I'll tell folks, judges and prosecutors hang together like pole dancers in the pole. They just do. I mean, it, it, was, so, it was such a remarkable thing for judge to sanction the prosecutors in the Ted Stevens case. It was so unusual. I mean, it, 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 you know, everybody thinks of justice as a set of scales and it's equally balanced, and it isn't. Prosecutors are before judges constantly. The same lawyers, the same prosecutors appear in federal court all the time. The judges get to know them. In some cases, this is true of defense lawyers, famous, big-name defense lawyers. But the relationship between, they're all government. Federal judges, government. The FBI is government. The DOJ is government. They're all government. And in day-to-day -day acknowledgement, they're all on the same team.
And so there's always been massive amounts of leeway extended to prosecutors because the judges all figure, what are we doing here if the perp didn't do it? The perp must have done it or we wouldn't be going through all this. And there's, there's this, that's, I've learned this the hard way. There were these massive assumptions that if you're charged, you did it, that they wouldn't waste time charging you if you didn't do it. Well, that's crazy. And we're seeing this now. George Papadopoulos was set up. Flynn was set up. I think Trump has been set up in all this. So late yesterday, Judge overseeing the Flynn criminal case, ordered Mueller to turn over all of the government's documents and memos related to Flynn's questioning by the FBI. By Friday, all of this happened one day after Flynn's lawyers revealed the FBI told Flynn not to bring a lawyer to his interview with them. We can only hope that Judge Sullivan might want to know why the FBI misled Flynn and basically interviewed him in a criminal intent without telling him this and then telling him he didn't need to bring a lawyer, denying him legal representation. Judge Sullivan might want to know why the FBI took a far more aggressive approach in handling the Flynn interview than it ever did with Hillary and her aides, or even George Papadopoulos. Now, the article here uh, notes that the FBI agents took seven months to write up a 302 report. The 302 report is supposed to be done contemporaneously to document the interview. The 302 report just reviews what happened, just reports what happened, reports who said what after who was asked what. The 302 doesn't say, we think the perp did it. We think you need to sentence this guy for the rest. It just reports what was said, what was asked. And it took them seven months. It, should, it could have been done in a day. The interview with Flynn was done. It's transcribed. You've turned it over to the court. They took seven months to write up the 302. Now, given that Judge Sullivan overturned the conviction of Ted Stevens, prosecuted by many of the same people who are on Mueller's team, there are people hoping that he might overturn this. It's Emmett Sullivan is the judge. He was the star of Sidney Powell's book. And he's the same judge that this case, the Flynn case, should have never been brought. And I hope Judge Sullivan throws this, this entire thing out because of what they've done to this man. Is this. There's not a lawyer in this country that was going to ever send Michael Flynn away to jail, no matter what they claim he did. The guy is a 30-year decorated military hero. He has done nothing but serve this country. Now, Mueller, with all of these redactions in the sentencing memo and all that he's released, it's made to look like uh, this guy is such a snake, folks. These people in this special prosecutor's office and this, this whole cabal in the DOJ are just a bunch of snakes. Redacting all of that stuff makes it look like there may be some really, really bad, sinister stuff that Flynn did. It is, it is so unfair. It's just basically unfair what they have done to this guy. They've destroyed him financially. They forced him into copying a plea to something he didn't do that they set him up to do in order to save his family in the house. So they issue this sentencing document with all of these redactions made to look like, wow, he must have really violated a bunch of national security to think he didn't do anything. It's all PR. It's all buzz. There wasn't a judge that was going to send this guy to jail for a day. He'd get promotion or probation or some such thing. Well, now Judge Sullivan wants to see everything that, le that, that, that led into this. And when you're the FBI and you're in the, in the White House casually there and you run into, hey, you got time for a little chat here? And you conduct what is an official interview that you don't tell him's official. In fact, you tell him he doesn't even need a lawyer. And then after that, you charge him with lying, even though the agent, after the interview, said, and two other agents agreed, that they don't think Flynn lied. So what the hell is this charge about? Michael Flynn's being punished for working for Donald Trump. Michael Flynn 
is a bowling pin that has to be knocked out of the way on the way to getting at Donald Trump. The same thing with Michael Cohen. And the same thing with Roger Stone. And the same way with anybody they think they can chip out of the way in order to get to Trump. There isn't any justice in any of this. And, and Comey is in the thick of this. You know, when liberals get together and they think only themselves are in the room, and it's only liberals listening to other liberals, they speak freely. According to the FBI summary of Michael Flynn's 302 interview, Andrew McCabe and FBI officials decided the agents would not warn Flynn that it was a crime to lie during an FBI interview because they wanted Flynn to be relaxed. And they were concerned that giving the warning might adversely ex affect the rapport. See, they didn't want Flynn to think he was being officially interviewed. So they didn't tell him that he had a right to have an attorney present. He would have known that if he would have known the reason this little chat was taking place. But he didn't even know that. The FBI walks into the White House as far as Flynn knows. We're all on the same team here. Flynn has no idea they're coming to set him up. They decided they would not warn Flynn it was a crime, meaning they didn't say, by the way, you can get an attorney. By the way, if you tell us things aren't true, you could be in trouble. They didn't say any of that. And Comey says it's because they wanted Flynn to be relaxed. That's not why they didn't tell him. They wanted him to slip up. They were trying to create a process crime here in a so-called casual discussion setting that was actually an official interview. And it was Comey's idea. Comey said something I probably wouldn't have done or wouldn't have gotten away with in a more organized administration. Comey is saying, if there had been a bunch of people in the White House who knew what was going on, I couldn't have gotten away with this. He's telling other liberals in the room how they pulled this off. They got a new administration led by Donald Trump from the outside, not suspecting that anybody's on the warpath to set him up or any of that, especially Flynn as a decorated war hero. He should have known these are all Obama people, and Obama hated him. Flynn ran the Defense Intelligence Agency. That's the Defense Department's version of the CIA. And he did so with extinction or distinction and great honor. And these guys came to set him up. And Comey's admitting to some of his buddies. Yeah, I probably wouldn't have done this if somebody in that White House had known what's going on. Meaning, they fully intended to take advantage of the naivete of newly arrived personnel in the Trump administration. Something I probably wouldn't have done or wouldn't have gotten away with in a more organized administration. So even this, he's, he's, he's bragging about how he outsmarted this dimwit Trump. And his administration, yeah, outsmarted them by lying to them, by telling them, yeah, you don't need a lawyer. Yeah, you, 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 you don't worry about lying to us. No warnings whatsoever. Comey continued. He said, in the Bush administration or the Obama administration, if the FBI wanted to send agents into the White House itself to interview a senior official, you'd have to go through the White House counsel. There'd be discussions and approvals and who would be there. And I thought, it's early enough. Let's just send a couple of guys over there. They're not going to know what's going on. And that's what they did. They sent a couple of FBI agents, including one of the management types, McCabe. And he's strolling around the White House and runs into Flynn. Hey, Mike, how you doing, buddy? And they sit down and they start having a chat. Little does Flynn know it's an official interview. With Comey admitting that they set it up this way. And look at the people Comey surrounded himself with. The FBI is supposed to be interested in getting the bad guys, right? Justice personified, the flag and all of that. And who are the people Comey surrounded himself with? McCabe, Peter Struck, Stroke, Smirk, Lisa Page. 
for crying out loud, Comey wasn't fired soon enough once Trump figured out the lay of the land here. Comey should have been gone the minute Trump won the presidency. So after Comey is fired, he then helps engineer the hiring of Robert Mueller as special counsel by leaking classified information. Guess what Comey does now? Comey is teaching ethics at William and Mary College. Ethics. After bragging about the fact that they set up a 30-year military hero by not even asking the White House counsel if they could come over and conduct an interview with Flynn. They just strolled in. Hey, Mike, great to see you. Flynn says, hey, Andrew, what's happening, babe? And they start chatting. And from that, Robert Mueller charges Flynn with lying. Even though McCabe later said he didn't think that Flynn was lying. So this is why Judge Sullivan wants to see all of the documentation and all of the memos. But I'm sorry, folks, I think this is a bombshell. James Comey admitting they bypassed normal White House protocol when he sent a couple of agents in there to interrogate Flynn. Something I probably wouldn't have done or wouldn't have gotten away with in a more organized administration. Bush or Obama, the FBI wanted to send agents in the White House itself to interview a senior official. You'd have to go through the counsel's office. There would be discussions of Donald Trump. Now, if they've done this with Flynn, what have they done with Cohen? A guy who actually has committed a whole lot of crimes above and beyond, way nothing to do with Donald Trump. But it's just one setup after another, after a totally false and fake premise, Russian collusion between Trump and Putin to steal an election. By the way, I have now been informed, Licensed to Lie, the great Sidney Powell book, is available now at Amazon. It was wasn't for over a year, a year or two, but it's now available. I really would recommend it to you. It's going to have you spitting mad. You're, it's a page turner, even though it's it's factual. It's it's historical, but it's not dry or dull at all. It starts out with the Enron trials, the task force. You will not believe what this bunch of prosecutors did to innocent people at Merrill Lynch. You will not believe what they did. But as many of you as possible reading this book and learning what they did, you'll have a far greater understanding of what's gone on in the entire Mueller investigation. But the Ted Stevens case, you'll have to read a while to get to it. But Judge Emmett Sullivan eventually vacates the conviction and just chastises these prosecutors and demand they go to what is essentially prosecutor rehab. But Judge Emmett Sullivan eventually vacates the conviction and just chastises these prosecutors and demand they go to what is essentially prosecutor rehab. But Judge Emmett Sullivan eventually vacates the conviction and just chastises these prosecutors and demand they go to what is essentially prosecutor rehab to relearn their jobs to relearn ethics i mean suborning witness of the uh, suborning perjury of their star witness making the contractor lie well that's what's exactly been accused here roger stone jerome corsi every number of people here are saying that Mueller is demanding that they lie about things in order to get a plea deal and they don't know what to do you never lie to these people, even when they tell you to. Because if you lie to them once, even after they've told you to, they can always deny they told you to lie and come back and get you later. They get you coming and going. By design, once they've got their sights set on you, you can't slither out of this. They're going to get you coming or going if you're in the way of where they ultimately want to go. And all of these people are ultimately in the way of where they want to go, which is Donald Trump and a political casket. And El Rushbo at EIBnet.us. You know, all this talk about trying to peel away all of these people close to Donald Trump so they can have a beeline at him to finally impeach him and get rid of him. 
More than 25 people have been fired or resigned from the FBI DOJ over this nonsense. Now, it's not publicized much. There's not a lot of news made about it because it doesn't make that organization look good, so the drive-by media doesn't talk about it. But more than 25 people have been fired or resigned, including McCabe, including Struck Stroke Smirk, including Page, including Bruce Orr, including Bill Priestap. It's a bunch of these people, plus Comey. Comey has been fired. He is gone. Top people that Comey had a hand in picking. They're all gone. Now, I cannot, and I, maybe I shouldn't emphasize this as much because I don't know what Judge Sullivan is going to do. All I know is what Judge Sullivan has done. And in the Ted Stevens case, whew, folks, it was just outrageous what they did to that man. And it, 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 the thing I took away from it after reading it, reading about it, it was obvious, the prosecutorial misconduct. It was plentiful. There was lots of it, unquestionably. There, was, there, there weren't periods of confusion or indecision about it. It was slam dunk prosecutorial misconduct. And it took forever to deal with it. it. It was a major, major operation to even acknowledge it. These people, if nothing else, circle the wagons. This is the entire DOJ, from the judges down to the prosecutors, the line prosecutors, the clerical people. They're all on the same team. And I'm telling you, when they all get into court, there are so many assumptions that take place, and chief among them is that the perpetrator did it. And so the bias that is extended to prosecutors in trials like this whether it's the result of unfairness or bias, I don't know, and it's not even the point. It's just the formula. It's just the way it is and has been. Some defendants are a little rare. I mean, it's, 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 some, it's even tougher sometimes to convict a terrorist because we don't want to be accused of any kind of anti-Muslim bias or this or that. But in a case like Ted Stevens, a United States senator, it's amazing. This case should have been thrown out months before it was. The prosecutors in that case should have been sanctioned months before they were. The, the last step the judge took was sanctioning the prosecutors when it should have been a slam dunk with the first indication he had of what happened. The, the case almost survived the prosecutors suborning perjury. That's how deeply ingrained the formula and the process on the prosecution side of these kinds of cases is. And I guess the overriding bias is that we wouldn't be here if the perp actually hadn't done it. If the perp was innocent, we wouldn't even be here. But they ruined the career of a United States senator named Ted Stevens over $150,000 approximately of a home repair bill. And they got the contractor to lie about it. The star witness. The whole case was thrown out. The conviction was vacated and overturned after Ted Stevens had lost his Senate seat. He was a Republican from Alaska. And he died shortly after all of this happened. And nobody knows whether the, the stress, the angst, the agita had anything to do with his, uh, with his death. But, I mean, it, it just, it's just outrageous. And it, it took, it was such a hard thing to do. It should have been easy. It should have been a slam dunk. And this is... One of the problems I think people have with the criminal justice system, one slip up by a perp and that's it, you're gone, buddy. The prosecution can slip up over and over again and the benefit of the doubt is extended. Oh, they didn't mean to do it, judge, sorry. We overlooked the 302, yeah, you know what? We, we submitted to you the wrong one. Well, I give you to the end of the week to make it right. It's just, it's maddeningly frustrating. And then when I find out that these, these prosecutors, many of them, who've been sanctioned and had to go to prosecutor rehab, uh, essentially equivalent of, and relearn ethics, or in Mueller's team. He hired them, even after all of this. 
and many of them were on the Enron Task Force. And the Supreme Court of the United States overturned all of those convictions. And the ancillary people whose lives were ruined in the Enron trials, the Nigerian barge case ended up, this was an offshoot of the Enron trials, the Nigerian barge case, a couple of people at Merrill Lynch that didn't do diddly squat, spent years in prison, lost their careers, nearly lost their families. They were innocent from the get-go. Judges, appellate judges, wouldn't listen. And now we've got the same scenario f unfolding right before our very eyes, and this time the target isn't Ken Lay or Jeff Skilling at Enron, it's Donald Trump. And the people going by the wayside are not from Merrill Lynch in the Nigerian barge case. They are Michael Flynn and Michael Cohen and anybody else they can ensnare. Roger Stone, Jerome Corsi, are you kidding me? Russian collusion, tampering with the votes in the 2016 election, and we're now down to getting rid of a president because of payments? To silence a porn star? When in 1998 we were told how silly this is, it's just sex? In fact, let me, let me get to the audio some bits. And in this, I want you to hear something. This is how bad this gets. Fox News has the eminently popular Judge Knapp, Judge Andrew Napolitano, and he is paraded before the cameras as a judicial expert and analyst. And so he was on Fox last night, the Fox Business Network. He was on with Elizabeth McDonald, and he made the point. Well, I'm going to let you listen to what he says. He essentially get something tremendously wrong here. But because he's on Fox, ostensibly conservative, the Fox audience hears this, and they think it's slam dunk. So the question that Judge Knapp was asked, Judge Knapp, uh, former Trump attorney Michael Cohen, sentenced to three years in prison of somebody to eleven here, by the way, Mike, what is, what is your take on, on Cohen's sentence to three years? I don't think this is good for the president, and I don't think many people in the legal community take him seriously if he says, I'm exonerated. I realize there are arguments on both sides. There are people who don't think this is a crime, and the president has argued it's not a crime, but a federal judge found that it was. What's the crime? The crime is taking corporate funds to confer a benefit on a campaign and not reporting it. Now, Judge Napolitano just said, and he's not right, and he's not right, and he's not right, and he's not right. A federal judge found that it was. What's the crime? The crime is taking corporate funds to confer a benefit on a campaign and not reporting it. That a judge found that the president had committed a crime. The judge found no such thing. The judge accepted a plea. The judge found no such thing. The judge accepted a plea. A federal judge found that it was. What's the crime? The crime is taking corporate funds to confer a benefit on a campaign and not reporting it. The judge found no such thing. The judge accepted a plea. The judge found no such thing. The judge accepted a plea. Just because Cohen says he did this, does not mean Trump did it. Just because Cohen says he did this does not mean Trump did it. Just because Cohen says he did this does not mean Trump did it. Just because Cohen says he did it in a plea deal does not mean the case has been decided. Just because Cohen says he did it in a plea deal does not mean the case has been decided. Just because Cohen says he did it in a plea deal does not mean the case has been decided. A defendant pleading guilty still has to go before a jury and make the case, and so do the prosecutors. The plea deal is not anything affirmative or final. And just because the judge accepts the plea deal doesn't mean the judge is ruling on the criminal activity that the plea indicates, in this case, Trump. Well, Andy McCarthy saw this.
and he was very frustrated by pretty much what I just told you. He was on Lou Dobbs on the Fox Business Channel a little later and said this. I was quite surprised just a few minutes ago watching Judge Napolitano on the program right before yours say a federal judge had ruled that this was a campaign finance violation. That's not what happened at all. What happened was the Southern District charged what is very dubiously alleged to be an in-kind campaign finance donation, and Cohen elected, I think for strategic reasons, to plead guilty to that charge without challenging the underlying question, yeah. which is a profound legal question, about whether it actually is an in-kind contribution or not. The judge didn't rule on that. Cohn's concession on this point is not binding on the president in any way. Nor is it binding on the judge. Cohen could have plead guilty that ple the, the, the Trump ordered him to send the porn star to Mars in order to get her out of the campaign. He could have said that and the judge would have accepted the plea. Doesn't mean that's what Trump did. My point is that talking about legalities is the same thing as talking about any other technicality. There are experts and there are plebes. And experts have a way of speaking and make themselves sound authoritative and believable when they may not even know what they're talking about. Or they may know what they're talking about and they can't keep their bias out of things. You just, you just never know. But this kind of stuff is allowed to happen. It does happen because the people that hire these people don't know whether they know what they're talking about. I mean, anybody can be on TV or radio now. It doesn't matter what kind of expertise you've got. Just uh, are you good TV? Do you sound like you know what you're talking about? People want to watch you. And that's, that's all it takes. Same with journalists. You don't even do journalism anymore to be on TV. You better be a left-wing hack, if anything else, if you're going to be a journalist at the New York Times, CNN, Washington Post. Journalism is the last thing anybody's looking for right now. That's not the objective here. Journalism will only get in the way of what we're trying to do, which is get Donald Trump. But it's, it's quite a serious thing to say that a judge acknowledge that Donald Trump committed a crime, a campaign finance violation, simply by accepting the plea of somebody who's trying to say whatever it takes to get a reduced sentence. In this case, Cohen. It doesn't matter what the defendant says or who he is, it doesn't matter what the plea is. A judge accepting it does not mean the judge is ruling on it and confirming it or affirming it. It is, this is a tough mountain to, uh, to climb here in terms of the average ordinary American trying to keep track of all this stuff. And you want to talk about built-in bias. The built-in bias for law enforcement cannot be denied. It's just law enforcement's the same as the fire department, same as Santa Claus. They're all decent. It's all good. It's all fair. Nobody would waste time on the innocent and so forth. Uh, you know what the federal prosecutor conviction rate is? It's like 95%. That's what Ted Stevens and his lawyers beat. A 95% conviction rate in federal court. If you find yourself in federal court and they're really lined up against you, you've got a 5% chance of winning while going broke, more than likely in the process, if you choose to contest it. And who's got the money to compete with the United States Treasury? They don't. And so here come the plea deals, and here come the process crimes, because prosecutors' offices are into stats. They're into convictions. Individuals get bonused. They get hired with high-paying jobs in the private sector based on convictions. This guy just, it's, I mean, it is what it is. And it's always been this way. There's nothing new about it. It's just that in this particular case, they already, for two years, they've had their conclusion. For two years, they've had what they know they want, their guilty pleas. And what they've done is they've spent two years trying to get there. And however they can get there is what they're going to do. Because they know that there isn't anybody that's going to stop them. There isn't anybody that can. Oh, no, the bottom line is that Flynn wants this guilty plea.
He's told a judge, he and his lawyers have told his judge. The judge has offered them an opportunity to go a different route here. He doesn't want to go the different route. So Flynn not wanting to go the different route is going to be a very determinant factor here in the in the sentencing, which has uh, yet to happen. But the judge is telling Flynn that, you know, this is a very bad thing you did here. You lied to the FBI while you're in the White House. That's a very, very bad thing. But what Flynn is saying to himself is, I did worse than that. Or they're charging me with worse. They're charging they're charging me with not registering as a foreign agent. They're charging me with a bunch of stuff. I don't want to go there. They've agreed to take all that off the table instead of lying to the FBI. I want to stick with this judge. Greetings, my friends. Great to have you. Rush Limbaugh back at it. Ha happily so here. 800-282-2882. If you want to be on the program, Flynn's admitting he knew that lying to the FBI was a crime. What, what this is all about, and the reason why we are even talking about this, is because James Comey has been out bragging for about a week now what he got away with. He got away with setting Flynn up, and he's made no bones about it. And so a lot of people have said, well, for crying out loud, this judge has already sanctioned previous lawyers, many of them the same on Mueller's team, for similar tactics in other trials. And so a lot of people are hoping that the judge will recognize similar prosecutorial misconduct here and throw it out. That's what people were hoping to be thrown out. Flynn doesn't want it thrown out. I don't think Flynn thinks everything against him would be thrown out. So he's adamant. They, look, this is how they, they I, think, I think Flynn's scared to death, folks. I, 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 you, in his situation, there's no way he can battle these people. He's already down. He's lost his... his life's work he's lost uh, much of his financial security he's lost his house and the last thing that happened was that Mueller threatened to go after his son and so I mean you, you reach a point where no matter how principled you are you don't have the resources to carry on such a fight not like Flynn wants to go the GoFundMe route or any of that but it, it's clear that 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 he was set up here in fact let me give you the scenario what what happened this is in, um, I, it, it's, I'm, I'm still confused of whether what we're talking about was in the, during the transition or shortly after Trump was inaugurated, but Flynn was in the White House, and I think it was during the transition, uh, but it, it could have been after, it was in January at some point, pre or post inauguration, and Flynn was the either incoming or national security advisor for Trump. Now, you remember, at this point in time, we're just two or three months removed from the election, and the media and the drive-bys are going crazy with Russian collusion. Russians affected the outcome of the election. Russians stole the election. Did Trump work with them on that? Um, everybody is trying to make the case that the election was illegitimate, ought to be overturned. Trump's not legitimately president. The election was... Uh, but you remember, I mean, th this was in the early days of that when there were four or five stories a day from anonymous sources in the intelligence community in the CNN broadcasts and in the Washington Post, New York Times pages, and it was, we were just being hit from every angle with this. And so this is when McCabe calls Flynn. McCabe, Andy McCabe at the FBI calls Flynn, and he doesn't talk to him about Russian collusion. He doesn't ask him about that. He says, look, uh, I'm seeing stuff in the media that you might have talked to the Russian ambassador about sanctions. See, Obama had placed sanctions on the Russians after the election as part of the farce that the Russians had tampered. So Obama had to make it look real, so he, he expelled 35 Russian diplomats slash spies, sent them packing, and instituted economic sanctions on Russia. And so the media is reporting that Flynn was talking to the Soviet ambassador, the guy that basically all this guy ever did was go to lunch with people, Sergei Kislyak. And McCabe calls Flynn and says, look, I'm seeing all this stuff in the media that uh, you're talking to Russians about, about the sanction stuff, and uh, you know, I, I just want to get it straight from you. What's going to happen? I sent a couple people over. Flynn says, fine, fine. Flynn's thinking, hey, this is this is going to be a cakewalk because this isn't even about what everybody's all hop trot about, Russian collusion. So the two agents get over there, and you know what Flynn says to him? 
Flynn says, I don't even know why you guys need to talk to me. You know all of this. And what he meant was that he knew that the Russian ambassador was being surveilled. Everybody knew the Russian ambassador being surveilled, and Clint, Flynn had been carrying on the phone conversations with him. And so Flynn knew that the FBI knew what was being said back and forth. And he says to the agents, you guys know all of this. Well, I don't know why you need to ask me anything. So they didn't tell him that it was official. They didn't tell him that he needed a lawyer. They didn't tell him they were investigating anything per se. It was set up very casually. Andy McCabe calls Michael. Hey, I'm seeing this stuff in the media about the sanctions and you and uh, Kislyak. I, I, look, I, I need you to set me straight on it. Now, you could argue that the antenna for Flynn should have risen at that moment, should have been very suspicious. But at the same time, there's something that... One, one of my great fears of social media is is what it does to young people in terms of the desire for fame when when that happens to anybody they they change they become different people and especially if they think they've acquired it and especially especially when they haven't but if they think they have so if you're on social media and you've got 50,000 likes or whatever it is that they measure feedback with you can easily tell yourself that you become a big deal you become a star that red carpet invitations are just around the corner uh, and, and if there's other media attention to whatever you're doing on social media, it can, can further the illusion that somebody, and, and most people do want fame until they get it, and most people do want to be recognized and be asked for autographs. And I think a measure of this happened to Flynn at some point after he came out for Trump, Anything associated with Trump made big news. Jeff Sessions endorsing Trump made big news. Sessions became more widely known and and adored by Trump supporters than had ever been at any time in his career. And the same thing happened to Flynn. And once, take it from one who knows, folks, because it did not happen to me. I am either too humble or insecure to ever get a big head. But I see it in everybody that's got it. And it's instantly recognizable. Somebody who thinks they're big stuff when they're not. And they act it and they act like you know they're big stuff and that you think they're big stuff. It's a And something happened to Flynn after he came out for Trump and started attracting all this attention, started speaking at Trump rallies. And he did, within a certain universe, become somewhat of a quote-unquote star. And prior to that, Michael Flynn had never been any of that. He had been a total, by definition, job title, performance, background guy. He ran the Defense Intelligence Agency. He was a decorated uh, military hero. And those people do not, on a rare occasion, draw attention to themselves. It's just the exact opposite. But he started doing that. And it just changes people in some ways not for the better. So I, 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 don't, I don't know what Flynn's attitude was when he was talking to these guys, but he clearly said to them, I don't even, you guys know all this, because he knew that Kislyak's phone calls were being surveilled, monitored. So that should have been one of the first red flags, because he realized they already knew what the conversations had been. If Flynn had done something illegal... For example, it told Kislek, buy time, man, sit tight, we'll take care of these sanctions that Obama put on you after Trump's in office. Just don't do anything, don't raise hell, do not act like you're really ticked off about it, and Kislyak didn't. Kislyak faded into the background, and this is why Mueller thinks that Flynn lied to them. About not talking to them about sanctions. Flynn did not offer a quid pro quo. He did not say, look, if you sit tight and don't do anything, we will lift the sanctions. Donald Trump and I will fix what Obama did and everything will be back. He didn't say that. He just warned Kizziak to take it easy. And, and Mueller, everybody listening to the tapes of the conversations, considers that to be meddling. Uh, sending a signal to Kizyak. Now, depending on what Flynn said in the verbal interview, remember, the agents that talked to him didn't think he had lied, so his story must have been somewhat consistent. That brings us to today, 
where Flynn's being sentenced, and remember he has spoken for, was it 50, 60 hours to Mueller and his team? And, it, it, you know, with Comey out there at the 92nd Street Y and all over the place saying, we would never gotten away with what we did to Flynn in a more organized White House. Comey hates Trump. Comey just, just, just personally despises Trump. He's an affront to everything. And Comey cannot help himself. He's out there bragging and, and, and engendering laughter in, from audiences, basically admitting that they got away with setting Trump, uh, uh, Flynn up. We ran a scam on the guy because nobody in the Trump White House had the slightest idea what they were doing. Anybody should know when two FBI agents come talk to you, it isn't casual. And we shouldn't even be able to get to him without going to the White House Counsel's office. We just called up uh, Flynn, and he said, yeah, come on over. So Comey's bragging. So it, that gives people the impression that the FBI knew that they had behaved at the edges of the law and at the edges of propriety. And this has led people to go back and look now at previous trial practices of the Mueller investigators and lawyers in the Enron case cases and the Ted Stevens trial, and they they did much the same thing uh, and have been overturned at the Supreme Court on every Enron case, and the Ted Stevens case was thrown out. So up to today, late last week, all through the weekend, a lot of people, because the same judge, sanctioned these same lawyers for Enron malpractice, my term, and and the Ted Stevens case. And a lot of people were hoping the judge, and Mueller, by the way, did not turn over everything the judge requested. The judge wanted every document related to this interview with Flynn. And Mueller said, screw you, and basically submitted a redacted 302. 302 is an FBI summary of an interview. So a lot of people have been waiting for fireworks to blow. A lot of people have been waiting for the judge today to basically throw the Flynn case out, tell Mueller to let him go and not hang, hang, bother him anymore, and uh, sanction Mueller for their practices. And part of that has been the judge asking Flynn and his lawyers, are you sure you want to do this plea. Are you sure you want to? Ex and Flynn and his lawyers are adamant that they want this deal. They want, Flynn wants to keep this plea. He doesn't want to change it. He doesn't want to be subjected to other charges. He basically, I don't know if scared to death is the term. Um, decorated Marine heroes, I don't know, scared. But clearly he doesn't want any more of Mueller. He's lost pretty much everything now, and uh, he doesn't, he's got options on the table which end this, other than his continued cooperation with Mueller, which he's already done 50 or 60 hours of. So, I, a lot of people were hoping that this judge would just throw things at well, the kitchen sink at Mueller chastise him for the exact behavior that we've seen in the Enron cases and in the Ted Stevens trial. But with Flynn maintaining that he wants this deal, uh, if the judge accepts the plea, then that's, that's pretty much that. Now, the judge could go on and have some harsh words for Mueller and his team over this. I, I have, I literally have no idea how this is going to go, but I can tell you this, uh, there isn't, well, I was going to say there isn't a single person in Washington. I can tell you, there isn't anybody in Washington, D.C. that wants a wall. There, there's not an other than people in the Trump administration who do. I mean, nobody outside the Trump, in this whole town. Nobody wants a wall, and I don't think anybody wants to go to bat for Michael Flynn. I think the entire town of Washington, D.C. is hoping that Mueller has something that gets rid of Trump. I think that whole town is just wired in total support of Mueller and hoping that he's got something. And so they... They're looking at 
at Flynn accepting the plea and not taking the opportunity to forget it and maybe go a different way. They're looking at this as a, as a profound and great Mueller victory, which is what, uh, what they all want. That has become true in American law enforcement. The cops, the FBI, and this is the Supreme Court has said so, can lie. They can lie to you, they can deceive you, they can do anything, particularly if they're pursuing a confession. And it's been upheld in a, at least one Supreme Court case. I'd say if, if let me, let me make, what, what has happened to Flynn here and a lot of these people, let me make it personal. Imagine a police car following you literally all week. A police car. Wherever you go, however you get there, whatever you do, for an entire week, there's a police car following you. The red light's not on. It's just following. It's going everywhere you go. It's seeing everything that you do. It's pretty certain that at some point you're going to get a ticket for something along the way. You're going to exceed the speed limit by a mile an hour. You're going to run a questionable yellow light. You're going to maybe do something else. I mean, you if, if somebody is surveilling you, 24-7, for a week or a month. Okay, now imagine that it is the FBI or the Department of Justice. Imagine if CIA agents, if the Senate Intelligence Committee is following you around, every, listening to every phone call you make and get. There's not a place you can go that they can't keep track of you. This is what is happening to Donald Trump. And there isn't, and this, these campaign violations that they're claiming uh, with, with these women, I mean, I want to dig into that at some point because that is absurd on so many levels. Have you ever gone hunting in the zoo? Because that's, that's basically what is happening here. The FBI and the DOJ are going hunting in the zoo. I mean, what kind of challenge is it? You've got everything you want to catch is entrapped in there, and there's no way they can get away from you, and you can kill or get whatever you want. That's what Mueller and the entire army of investigators are doing to Donald Trump and anybody in his, in his, uh, in his orbit. Here is here's what every lawyer... Every resident of Washington, D.C. knows to be a fact. If Paul Manafort had not worked for Donald Trump, if Michael Flynn had not worked for Donald Trump, if Michael Cohen, the rat, had not worked for Donald Trump, not a single one of them would have ever been targeted or prosecuted. Not a single one of them. I mean, in fact, Manafort was, and they decided it wasn't worth pursuing about four or five years ago. Manafort, this is his second rodeo on this. The first time they took a look at him, he's had some questionable behavior in terms of registering as a foreign agent with some of the lobbying that he was doing. I think for Ukraine, they only looked into it, and they exonerated him. They said, there's nothing to see here, nothing to do. But now you put Donald Trump, who had the audacity to win the 2016 election in the in the mix, and everything changes. I guarantee you they couldn't care less if I'm going after Michael Cohen. Not even SDNY, not even New York prosecutors would waste time with Cohen, and nor, nor, nor Manafort or especially Flynn. It is Flynn business, and that little side note here. The judge has made it plain to Flynn that he finds what Flynn did to be abhorrent lying while in the White House to the FBI as a member of an administration. The judges spared no words in shaming Michael Flynn. But at the same time, he is pursuing this, according to things that people in the courthouse are saying, in a, in a kind of strange way. He's making Flynn confirm multiple times that he knows what's going on here. Now, the prosecutors have recommended no jail time. The sentencing window for what Flynn's guilty of here, what he's pleading guilty to, is uh, zero to six months. And the prosecutors have told a judge they recommend zip. The judge can do what he wants. This is prosecutorial recommendation. As I pointed out to you last week, I don't think 
that Flynn was ever going to get jail time. 30-year decorated American military hero, first offense, questionable offense at that, possibly set up. But Mueller is getting the chance to make himself look magnanimous and good by recommending no jail time for this great American who, by the way, has been so overwhelmingly cooperative with us. Now, look, I'm not a lawyer, and I'm not, I, I have no idea what Flynn has said, but you don't sentence these people if you're going to use them at an upcoming trial. If you've got somebody and they've pled to something, you do not sentence them until they have followed through on the witness stand testifying to what they have assured you they would say. Now, when this happens, when somebody gets sentenced before they have testified, it means that there's not much value there, that they probably would not have been called as a witness. So then you can look at, okay, 60 hours he talked to Mueller, what did he say? And then you have to backtrack and say, well, maybe they don't ever expect to have a trial of Trump because what this is really about is getting Trump to quit, to resign, or uh, get his numbers down to 30s so that he loses all support. You know, that, that whole drill, which I've explained to you a number of times, it could well be that they don't envision a trial of, uh, of Trump. But the judge has, it's remarkable, uh, given Flynn a whole bunch of different opportunities to walk away from this, not accept the plea, which is raising some questions. Is the judge asking Flynn this so many times because the judge then wants to wants to throw the book at Mueller over how this all happened again? And if, if Flynn adamantly demands to accept the plea, then... So the judge is affirming, and every time he asks Flynn about this, he is making certain that Flynn understands everything in front of him here. He's asked Flynn, I don't know how many times, are you sure you want to plead to this? Are you, do you understand here you might get jail time? Just because they suggest that you don't doesn't mean I'm bound by it. You could, and, and Flynn has, I do not want to change this. This is the deal I made. I want to stick to the deal. I want to plead guilty to lying to the FBI. When he didn't. The FBI doesn't even think so. Now, that should tell you. Mueller gave the charge because that's the leverage he's got. He can charge anybody with anything, as you know. And never have to prove it in court if you can intimidate the witness or the perp uh, into bending your way. And it's not hard to do when you can break them. When you can bankrupt them, when you can threaten to destroy their family, you can pretty much get any little peon defendant to do because everybody becomes a peon up against the mighty treasury of the United States of America and a hell-bent, politically-oriented prosecutor. You know, the, the galling thing here is that so many people in Washington are at least as guilty, if not more guilty, than Flynn or Manafort or Cohen. Especially when you start analyzing campaign finance violations, this gets so in the way. That, so what they're saying is that the National Enquirer, by buying a story on one of these two women and then not running it, that's an in-kind campaign contribution. Well, how do you measure all of the pro-Hillary Clinton stories in the New York Times? What are they worth? Why are they not campaign con uh, contributions? Why do they not violate campaign finance law? Or how about all of the anti-Trump media on CNN alone that the Democrats didn't have to pay for? Why is that not a campaign finance violation? Is if they go down this road and if they say that a media company, which is what the National Enquirer is, although I should point out that the prosecutors in the swamp are saying, eh, Inquirer is not a media company, it's an entertainment company. This isn't First Amendment stuff. Don't kid us, but it is. They publish a paper. It's called the National Enquirer. They publish other things. So they say, no, they're not a media company, but if they are a media company. If a media company can be accused of committing campaign finance violations by not running a story that would hurt a candidate, in this case Trump, well, then what would happen if 
the New York Times was the target instead of the National Enquirer. What would happen if CNN was the target? They would be raising holy hell in the drive-by media. They would be saying, you can't come after us for this. It is our job to report the news. It's our job to decide what is news and what isn't news. And you can't say, because we didn't run a story, that it's a campaign contribution. So, yes, we can now, because we have just said the National Enquirer made a campaign contribution, in effect, to Donald Trump by burying a story that was not favorable. I'll tell you, these people are stepping over lines that they themselves drew for decades in order to get Donald Trump. And once you cross some of these lines, once you tell a media company that it's, it's, it's way of doing business, you tell a media company that the day-to-day -day conduct of its business equals campaign, com uh, campaign contributions or violations, there isn't a media company then that's innocent. There isn't a network that's innocent. There isn't a newspaper that's innocent because every damn one of them does favorable and unfavorable stories on candidates and campaigns. And if that stuff is now said to, and by the way, people who want to gain total control over the media, totalitarian type, are going to love this, folks. And this is where these drive-by journalists in their zeal to get Trump do not realize the precipice that they are approaching by supporting the notion that the Inquirer made a campaign contribution to Trump by burying a story. They do it all the time. Look at Newsweek and the Clinton story and Lewinsky. They buried it. If it weren't for Matt Drudge, nobody would have known about that. Did New Newsweek could be charged with a campaign violation because they buried a story that was uh, harmful to Bill Clinton. They spiked it. They didn't run the Lewinsky story. Drudge got it and did run with it. But if they can go after the Inquirer, you, might, you may not think they're a media company, but don't tell that to John Edwards. They got John Edwards kicked out of politics by following him around. He's having an affair and an illegitimate little wump amount, a little child papoose. So uh, they, they're eagerly supporting this idea that the Inquirer Shielded Trump for bad news equals a campaign contribution. <laughs> well, uh, Newsweek sure as hell did all that and more for Bill Clinton. Now, it wasn't a campaign going on, but it was, it was still highly detrimental to Bill Clinton and Hillary and whatever her future was going to be. And that's not the only example you could give. Just imagine if all of this attention focused on the Inquirer and Flynn and Cohen and Manafort were focused on any other news media. They couldn't withstand it either, nor could anybody else in the swamp. There isn't a single person in D.C. that could withstand this kind of scrutiny. It's like going hunting in the zoo. None of what I just told you is ever mentioned in the drive-by media. And as such, people that watch the drive-by media have no idea what's going on. You know what a big story in the drive-by media is today outside of all this stuff? Millennials are upset that there aren't enough women at the climate change conference in Poland. It's a bunch of old white guys, and therefore the wrong things are going to be done on climate change. A bunch of old fart white guys, and, the, and millennial journalists are fit to be tied. There aren't enough women there. That's what's big news outside of all this. This, as far as drive-by news consumers is concerned. This is over. Trump did it. Russia tampered with votes. And it's only a matter of time. Not old Mueller lowers the boom. Quick. Time out. Back with more. Now announce he's going to delay the Michael Flynn sentencing. He's back on the bench. By the way, he says he misspoke when he suggested Flynn was a foreign agent while in the White House. He didn't mean to say that. And he never meant to suggest that Flynn committed treason. He told reporters not to read too much into the questions he's asking. You know, doesn't all of this Flynn stuff kind of blow the smithereens, the idea that Trump was colluding with the Russians for years? What I mean is, if, if Trump had been colluding with the Russians, Flynn wouldn't have to tell Kislyak to be okay with the sanctions and the expelled diplomats. The Russians would already know that, right? Need for Flynn to pass off any information to the Russians if they've been colluding with Trump for years? This is such... This is such caca, folks. It, 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 it gets more ridiculous each and every day. And now the judge has delayed the sentencing. Now, we announced that before the conclusion of previous hour. We didn't know why. 
The judge now has decided to suggest maybe, Flynn, you want to wait. Prosecutors, you want to wait until <laughs> the case is over and you might have to testify. Exactly what I said. You know, this is, this is starting to approach. This whole thing's a process crime. You understand a process crime? Flynn didn't do anything. So they get him on this nefarious idea that he lied to them in an impromptu interview that he didn't even know was an interview. The only reason, look, I don't know Michael Flynn from a pile of coal, and I admit that I'm speculating here, but I know enough to think the reason Flynn wants this deal and wants this over is because he's been ruined. But there's enough left that Mueller could ruin him further, like go after his kid, which Mueller threatened to do. Flynn desperately wants this to be over. It's been two years. Do you realize this? Two years over this, and it's a process crime, and this guy's a 30-year decorated military hero. His world is upside down. He may have some responsibility for it, but if, if he had never joined up and signed up with Donald Trump, they wouldn't care less who he is. In fact, Obama hated the guy and he left the Defense Intelligence Agency, he would be an invisible personage in Washington were it not for the fact that he openly endorsed Trump and started appearing at Trump rallies. A process crime. So here's, here's the latest on this. From Doomberg News, Michael Flynn, who was a campaign advisor to President Trump and briefly his national security advisor, is in Washington federal court for sentencing. Flynn's sentencing was postponed after Judge Emmett Sullivan told him to consider pushing it off until after he's completed assisting prosecutors. A status hearing scheduled for March. Flynn goes to court today thinking it's going to end and it's all going to be over and he's going to have a good Christmas. <laughs> and now it's been delayed until March. And I'll tell you this, too. There have been some drive-bys out there uh, in the last hour have been publishing pieces to us, aimed at us going, nye, 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 nye. you thought that the judge was going to throw the book at Mueller, and it hasn't happened. Nye, 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 nye. And now the judge doesn't want a sentence Flynn yet. And the reason the judge doesn't want a Flynn, sentence Flynn is exactly what I said. You don't sentence these guys until they have testified because you can't, you can't guarantee that they'll show up and testify after they're serving their sentence. You always make them pay the piper to get the good sentence and to get the good deal. And paying the piper is testifying. What if Flynn's got nothing to testify to? They were monitoring the phone calls he made with Kislyak. They know that he didn't engage in illegal behavior or conduct because they were surveilling Kislyak. And thus, they didn't charge Flynn with that. They had to make up this idea that he lied to the FBI. And again, the two agents that interviewed him don't think that he did. And you're saying, well, then why did he plead to it? Because they've ruined him, folks. Put yourself in his shoes. You always have to try to do that. When you're not in the arena, pretend to put yourself there and imagine yourself in this situation. And everything you've done has been wiped out. And everything you've got has been wiped out. And to pay lawyers to defend you against an enemy that cannot be beaten and will never go away, you want it to end. So you plead guilty to the process crime because of all the things that they could pursue you for, it's the least problematic. It's a process crime. Not that that's unserious. Lying to the FBI is never a good thing, we say dutifully here at the EIB Network. But it's a far different thing than being accused of treason or working on behalf of a foreign government to undermine your own government. And those are the kind of things that Flynn faced. Because Mueller and his team can go after anybody for anything they want if they have... Any any contact with Trump whatsoever, they can. That, that's the power prosecutors have. And remember, prosecutors can lie to you, they can deceive you, they can trick you into confessing. And a lot of people confess to end it. So, for some reason, the judge says, you know what? This is not going the way that I anticipated. Two things in the judge 
He's back on the bench uh, shortly before the previous hour ended, and he told everybody in the courtroom that he misspoke in suggesting that Flynn was a foreign agent while in the White House. He didn't mean to convey that. He says he never meant to suggest Flynn committed treason. He said not to read too much into the questions uh, that he that he asks. Uh, Sullivan resumed Flynn's sentencing hearing and expressed regret for an earlier statement which he falsely suggested Flynn's activities as an unregistered foreign agent continued into his time as Trump's national security advisor. Sullivan had asked whether that would be treason, and uh, the judge said, I feel terrible about that, adding he'd never presided over a treason case. Prosecutor Brandon Van Grack confirmed the facts and said the government has no reason to believe that the defendant committed treason. So they called a recess at 12.15 so, so Flynn could consult with his lawyers. Because the judge didn't want to accept the plea. They thought this was going to be over today. The judge kept asking, are you sure that you want to accept this plea? And the judge said, you, you sold your country out. You sold. Nobody has ever said that. But the judge told Flynn, you sold your country out. Then he said that the, well, the prosecutors say that Flynn's continued cooperation is a possibility. Oh yeah, we may have uh, we have may further need of him, Judge. Uh, may need to ask him some more questions. Well, judge said, "Well, what are we doing here on the plea?" See, everybody knows you don't accept the plea until you're through with the guy and he's going to testify. But Mueller's got nothing for him to testify to unless see this is the rub, unless they can do what they did in the Ted Stevens trial and scare the hell out of the lead witness into composing. Now, that actually is. Are you ready for this? That's actually a legal term. Composing versus testifying. Composing means you write. You make it up. Prosecutors ask their star witness in the Ted Stevens case to make some things up about Ted Stevens and what he expected for a $150,000 payment to remodel his house. And the witness had to do what the prosecutor said. I mean, they hold all the cards. So this term composing, it, it's, it's become remarkably, apparently, acceptable. Now, old line uh, lawyers like Professor Dershowitz are not happy with it, but it, it's right along the lines of prosecutors can lie and deceive and trick suspects uh, into confessing. And they do it all the time, especially got two perps side by side, and both perps did whatever the deed is. So you go to one of them, and say, yeah, the other one's in there singing like a bird, and it just you would not believe what this guy's telling us about you. I mean, you you better act fast before this guy finishes. The first guy to chat makes the deal gets the deal. That's how they do it. So you got these two perps. They both think they're both loyal to each other. Then they, then these guys come in and say, "Yeah, your, your buddy is in there. He's telling us things we never even suspected." And they panic and they unload, uh, and then later find out that their buddies were not saying a word, and that's all been proclaimed legal by the United States Supreme Court. So that's that's where we are. On this, the judge is delayed. When I I feel so for this guy, I can't tell you. To think today, finally, after two years, this is going to be over. He's going to get his life back. The judge asks him multiple times, "Are you sure? Do you understand what you are doing here?" Yes, the prosecutors are recommending zero jail time, but that's all that is. It's not a recommendation. It's not a demand. I make that call. And I don't think you committed treason. <laughs> Jeez. And the, re the reason I say this is kind of bogus. You remember the Russian troll farms that, that Mueller indicted? One of them was named Concord Management. And they're, they're, they're over somewhere in Mother Russia. And they were charged with trolling the Internet and planting pro-Trump posts and anti-Hillary posts. And Mueller, Mueller makes a big deal about indicting him. And Rosenstein goes out there, announces the indictment. And by the way, it was that 
press conference, that indictment where, where Rosenstein said, nothing in this indictment suggests that American citizens were involved. Nothing in this indictment suggests that votes were tampered with, and nothing in this indictment says that the results of any election were changed. Meaning, the Russians didn't do anything. They got on the Internet, they trolled. By the way, there's another story about that that I need to clear up today. Some, this happened in millennial journalism over the weekend, a, a bogus report on the success the Russians had uh, promoting pro-Trump messages on, on, on social media, and the whole thing is bogus, and I need to unpack that uh, today before the program ends. But anyway, Mueller's got nothing on these Russian trolls. He indicts them in Russia. He doesn't even serve them because he knows they're never going to be extradited to the United States. Mueller knows that the charges that he has made against them are never going to be tested because the Russians are never going to show up in court. So he doesn't even bother to serve them. Notice that they have been indicted. Well, the Concord Management Group hired an American law firm. Remember this, this is great. And the American law firm showed up in court and pleaded not guilty and demanded a trial. And you know what Mueller did? Mueller went to the judge and said, they can't do that, judge. We can't do that. They're still doing it. They're still doing it. Well, Gotti was still doing it when you indicted him. Didn't stop you from indicting him. Didn't stop you from indicting anybody. What do you mean they're still doing it? Well, judge, we're not prepared to make the case right now. But you just, you charge these people, and they've shown up here, and they've got an American law firm, and they're demanding a trial. They didn't do it, and they want to get their innocence adjudicated. Mueller never intended it to happen. I don't think he ever intended Flynn to testify, because there's nothing to testify to. Flynn didn't do anything. Flynn is pleading guilty to a process crime, supposedly lying to the FBI. There's... Probably nothing for Flynn to testify to, unless now they go to him and demand that he compose testimony. This is not the FBI that I always thought we had. It's certainly not the criminal justice system. This is clearly two-tiered criminal justice system for all of us and another for Democrats and denizens of the Washington swamp. They have, they have turned every waking hour of life in Washington, D.C. is now an investigation of Donald Trump. And now they're, they're going to be able to say, and they may be saying it in certain quarters, I don't know. If not yet, I want to warn you to be on the lookout because you're going to need a steel spine to put up with this too. The next line is going to be, even if he didn't do any of it, this has never happened before. Every aspect of the man's life, every inhale and exhale of breath is being investigated. We can't go on this way. There has to be something there. Nobody has ever been investigated to this extent, and it doesn't just happen. So they're going to say that even if there is no evidence about anything, the simple fact that there are so many investigations means it can't go on like this, and that it shouldn't. It's called flooding the zone, and I think he ought to do something else. And I will tell you, I told Rudy this way. Shut down this whole DOJ, right? Just shut it down. Use the power of the executive branch to shut this down. What's going on here is an outrage. All of this is happening on the biggest phony premise that the Steele dossier was legit. It isn't. Even... Now, Michael Isikoff, who was the first to report it, formerly of Newsweek, Michael Isikoff, the first to report Steele dossier, is out saying it can't be verified. Welcome to the party, Michael. We've known this for two years. But here's the guy who originally found it and brought it to the public's attention, admitting that it's, there's, there's nothing verifiable in it. And all of this that we're putting up with was started by that dossier including the FISA warrants to spy on Trump. Here's Robert Ray. Robert Ray uh, 
uh, on Fox News is that Robert Ray is a uh, former Whitewater Independent Counsel. He was on Fox, got a question. Is this the ending or is this just the beginning now for General Flynn? I think there was just simply a pause today, but that doesn't mean that things weren't accomplished today. The judge wanted to be sure that the defendant was pleading guilty because, in fact, he was guilty. And so that's why he asked the question first, did you know that lying to the FBI was a crime? And General Flynn answered in the affirmative. The judge wanted to know and be certain that that was so because otherwise there's no crime. And the second thing he wanted to know is, is there any other basis for you to withdraw your plea? Again, the question from the judge was, General Flynn, is there any reason why you are seeking now to withdraw your plea? And he answered no. So those were important things that Judge Sullivan wanted to satisfy himself about. Why? Then, well, because he's, as he said in his career, I have never taken a guilty plea from someone who's not guilty, and I don't intend to start now. Now, that to me is so damn telling. I think, I think the judge was prepared today to kind of lower the boom on the prosecutors, but Flynn blew that up by insisting that he knew what he was doing and wanted to accept the plea. But the judge, this is a hell of a comment here. I've never taken a guilty plea from somebody who's not guilty, and I don't intend to start now. Why in the world say that unless you have some suspicion that the guy's been forced into it, talked into it, because the agents have said that they didn't think he lied. And the judge reads papers. The judge follows the news. He knows that Comey's out there bragging about the stunt they got away with here because new administration disorganized and not knowing how things worked and so forth. There's one more bite that accompanies this, Catherine Herridge of Fox saying the judge mocked the prosecutors, but I have to wait for a little more time to air that one. Rush Limbaugh, simply brilliant. Catherine Herridge of Fox News says that the judge mocked the prosecutors today, which may indicate that uh, the judge knows what Mueller is up to. Yeah. I've never taken a guilty plea from somebody who's not guilty, and I don't intend to start now. That is one heck of a thing for a judge to say, and then delay the sentencing, even though Flynn wanted it. It was the day yesterday. Now, here's the Catherine Herridge uh, soundbite, and this was just moments ago, probably 10, 15 minutes ago, on the Fox News Channel. This is her take on what happened in the courtroom today, the, the Flynn sentencing. Here again, the... Summation, Flynn wanted this to end today and thought it was going to. He wanted to plead guilty to a process crime, not any other crime. He wanted, this was the deal. He sang, he told them what they wanted to hear, supposedly, and he gets a recommendation of no jail time and uh, for a plea of guilty to lying to the FBI. But the rub is that he probably didn't. And the judge said today that the reason he's uncomfortable with this is because he's never taken a guilty plea from somebody who's not guilty, and he doesn't intend to start now. So the judge didn't accept the plea and delayed the hearing until March. Poor Flynn thought it was going to end, thought it was going to be over today, except for his ongoing assistance of Mueller, but his days of jeopardy were going to end today. Cannot tell you how big a deal that is. You've been under the lights for two years. They've ruined you financially. They've taken away your house. You have to sell it to pay your lawyers. They've threatened to go after and ruin your son. So you want to bring it to a screeching halt. All you have to do is say you lied to the FBI when the FBI doesn't think you did. And the judge gave Mueller every, or gave Flynn every opportunity. Are you sure you know what you're doing here? Did you know this? Do you know that? Did you, did, did they tell you they were lying to the FBI? Did they tell you that's a crime? Did they, gave every opportunity. And Flynn would not say anything that would irritate or anger Mueller is what happened. I think Mueller owns him. I think Mueller owns anybody he wants to own in this thing. Because of the power that he holds to ruin is what the Mueller investigation is. And Flynn wanted out.
and pleading guilty was all he had to do. And he kept insisting to the judge that he wanted to. The judge ultimately says, nope, I need you to think about this some more. So clearly the judge is not convinced he's done something here that would even require a plea. That's my take. Now the drive-bys, you need to be warned that the drive-bys are saying the exact opposite of what I just told you. The drive-bys are saying here that what happened here in court today proves that Mueller is innocent. Mueller didn't use any trickery, chicanery. Mueller didn't do anything illegal. Mueller is clean and pure as the wind-driven snow, and this proves it does nothing of the kind. Here's Catherine Harridge's take on it. I want to note, put the special counsel uh, under scrutiny and possibly even on notice. He asked the special counsel whether talking to the Russian ambassador in December of 2016 was a crime. And the special counsel representative responded, it could be a violation of the Logan Act. And then the judge, sort of in a very unusual way and flip way, said, isn't that the act no one has ever been charged with? which was sending a signal as to what was at the heart of this case. So a lot of drama, a lot of opportunity for Michael Flynn to withdraw his guilty plea, to challenge the conditions of his FBI interview in January of 2017, which the judge said he found troubling personally, but Flynn has declined to do so. There you have it. The judge found it troubling. I'll tell you why. They tricked him, and Comey's out bragging about it. That they tricked him. Comey's out there telling anybody who would listen in a more organized, competent administration, we wouldn't have gotten away with this. What did they get away with? They sent a couple of agents into the West Wing, called Flynn. Hey, Flynn, Mike, or Andy McCabe here. I'm troubled here by what this uh, stuff I'm hearing in the media about you and the Russian ambassador. Let's send a couple people over to chat with you. Oh, sure, sure, sure. Have them come on over. And Flynn even said to these agents, I don't know why you need to talk to me, I'm sure you know all this, meaning that Flynn knew that his conversations with Kislyak were surveilled. They, they knew what Flynn had said, so what, I don't know why you need to talk to me. Should have been a red flag to Flynn at that point, but his ego was such that, hey, it's the FBI, we're on the same team here. They want to come chat with me, get their story straight, I'm more than eager to help. They had no idea, he had no idea they were gunning for him, that's what the judge's point is here. And then for the, that, that's what's troubling to the judge. And the Logan Act? The Logan, the judge is absolutely, nobody has ever been charged with it because it is not considered to be something everybody, anybody can ever be convicted of. It's, the thing is a hundred and some odd years old. The Logan Act is so old that it's, it's never been used. And for this prosecutor, for Mueller's prosecutor, well, Judge, you might have violated a Logan Act. And judge, oh, you mean that thing nobody's ever been charged with before? She's right. That's clearly, clearly mocking the uh, the prosecutor.